good morning. Good to have you here this morning. Again, after Thanksgiving, we had such a great time. I hope you did as well. You know, we ended up with, um, oh gosh, maybe 49 of us. Really, we did. And it was so fun because we had our older generation, which there's fewer and fewer, um, share a little bit, tell us one of their favorite, you know, Thanksgiving memories. And, and then we sang. We always sing, uh, which is you know, it could be a little embarrassing, but um, my brother-in-law hates it. But we do it together, and uh, just so grateful to have family, and uh, some that weren't family, but friends. First time, you know, without my mom, and my dad, you know, said, oh, the commander isn't here, you know, but we're good. And uh, so, yeah, she, she kind of organized us and got us together, but we are um, believing what that song said that we sang just before, and that is that we know who goes before us, right? And we know who goes behind. So, thankful. Well, one early Tuesday morning will be forever seared in our national consciousness. On that day, four airplanes were hijacked by terrorists bent on evil. Two of the planes crashed into the Twin Towers, of course, in New York City. We saw it over and over. One plane crashed in the countryside of Pennsylvania. And one plane slammed into the west side of the Pentagon. Most of the men and women had one mission in their mind when this was all taking place. And that was to get out of the building. But that day heroes were made. Warriors who didn't run. But stood their ground. In fact... They turned and entered into the fire, the battle for life, time and time again. After the attack on the Pentagon, former Airborne Ranger, Ranger Sergeant Chris Brahman was seen low crawling through the inferno. He was screaming to be, to be heard above the roar of the fire, dragging people to the perimeter and then into ambulances. Brahman worked relentlessly for 60 hours and rescued three, of which only one lived. And determined, he recovered 60 bodies from the building that day. When asked why he kept running in and out of that devastated and dangerous building, he said, we had people inside, and it's the nature of a military guy that we never leave anyone behind, even if it costs you everything. So when you understand what drives a man like Brahman to run back into the Pentagon, to run toward danger, to run into the deafening roar, then you will get a peek into the fighting men of David, David's men, that we will look at today. Now, we have taken a little bit of a hiatus here for a couple weeks, but we are heading back into the life and times of David. And you remember, he is the second king of Israel, chosen and anointed specifically by God. And just because mm, I just love this part, I need to say that I, I so love our God. Because he handpicked David. Not because he was the oldest son of the greatest man or because he was the wisest or more educated or the most successful. In fact, he was the youngest, the least of the brothers, and he was tending sheep on a rocky hillside. But God saw his heart. God uses a different matrix than man does to determine what is greatness. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, who was tasked to anoint this new king, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. David was a shepherd. He was a warrior. He was a king, he was a poet, and he was the only person distinguished in scripture as a man after God's own heart. And yet, David, though chosen and deeply loved by God, could not have done 
what he was called to do unless he had been surrounded by warriors, men faithful to him and to God. In the scripture, the 30 chiefs are aptly described as David's mighty men. Long before they were mighty men, they were wee little men. And let me explain what I mean. When we are first introduced to the original group of men who came to David while he was hiding out from Saul, which he is constantly doing because Saul wanted to kill him, this is what the scriptures tell us. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, David. And he became commander over them, and they were with him about 400 men. Men down on their luck, hated and hunted by Saul, in debt up to their eyeballs. In fact, it was highly probable that they or their family members, their daughters, their sons, their wives, would be sold into slavery to pay off their debt. And they were depressed. These guys were not loving their lives right then. So they were down on their luck, deep in debt, and despairingly discouraged. David, the one to be king someday, attracted those who either had failed at life or at the very least couldn't figure out how to outwit average. And they needed a place to belong. And a place to become the men that God had called them to be. So these men, they went to David, who was also an outcast. He was literally hunted by the status quo, the original kingdom, Saul's men. And over time, they became loyal friends. They became fierce warriors. Later noted in the annals of time, King David recalls and commends his mighty men. Now remember, before and after David took the throne, these men were constantly fighting with the Philistines. I mean, these guys were their perpetual enemies. They were like a thorn in their flesh. And so it was in battle, not in the fair times of life, but in the brutality of war, that these men won their reputation of valor and honor. Now, as I read through First and Second Samuel to prepare for this sermon, just every time I came across something that said David and his men, I decided I'm going to write it in the margins just to see how many times. For example, so Saul was hunting David. So David and his men kept moving from place to place. David and his men were far back in the cave because they were hiding. David and his men tore their clothing, fell down, and wept. David and his men went out on a raid. David and his men got early, up early in the morning. David and his men killed 350. David and his men marched to Jerusalem. David and his men carried the idols away. Great were the exploits of David and his men. And though some were, there were about 30 that were finally listed by name in the king's journals, three were even distinguished more, and they were listed as the greatest. And it kind of cracks me up because a couple weeks ago, Mike and I were talking about this weekend and what, what he wanted me to speak about. And he made mention that, you know what, this is going to be great. You know how he is. This is going to be just awesome. Because the guys in the crowd are going to love these stories about the mighty men. And I thought to myself, uh-huh, us girls too. Because who doesn't love Mel Gibson and Braveheart? Or uh, Chris Hensworth and Thor? You know, I mean, come on, we're going to love it too. So feel free, if you would, to look at 2 Samuel 23. That is going to be the chapter we'll kind of camp out in. But I'm going to, just right here at the beginning, I'm going to quickly summarize what David records as some of the, the three mightiest, greatest escapades. Several of David's men were fought giants. Now these guys, they were, you know, seven, eight, seven foot, seven, five. I think there was one that was actually recorded at eight feet. So these guys are big dudes. 
In fact, one of them was Goliath's brother. You remember David killed Goliath? And that one was his brother. And they, they killed these kinds of men. After a demeaning taunting, one of the mighty men killed a huge man. That's how the scripture records it. A huge man who had six fingers on both hands and six toes on both feet. 24 in all. It's recorded. One mighty man killed 800 men by a spear. One stood his ground when everyone else retreated, and he defeated the enemy alone. One warrior fought so long and so fiercely that his hand was frozen to the spear. You can imagine they had to peel it away after the battle was won. One warrior struck down two of the mightiest enemies. He killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day, and he took on large and a large Egyptian who was so big and strong that he carried a spear that weighed, just the tip weighed more than seven pounds. These guys were powerhouse. My dad used to call his high school wrestling team animals. These guys were animals. These men ran into battle to fight the enemy who threatened David. They stood their ground when their homes, their families, and their way of life was threatened. These men, broken, imperfect failures, became mighty men with David because of their love for David and for the community that they had created together. And David, he needed these men like he needed breath. Towards the end of David's life, after ruling for almost 40 years, he takes time to talk about these men, to give them credit for their friendship, their service, and heroics. And the scripture records, One day during harvest, the three parted from the thirty and joined David at the cave of Adullam. A squad of Philistines had set up camp in the valley of Rephraim. While David was holed up in the cave, the Philistines had their base camp in Bethlehem. David had a sudden craving, and he said, Would I ever like to drink a wa a, of water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem? So the three penetrated the Philistine lines, drew water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. But David wouldn't drink it. He poured it out as an offering to God, saying, there is no way, God, that I'll drink this. This isn't mere water. It's their lifeblood. They risked their very lives to bring it. And so David refused to drink it. And I love this. <coughs> Excuse me. That Samuel notes this. This is the sort of thing that the three did. At the time of this story... As was the norm for David in his early years, David is hiding again. The Philistines, the enemy, is surrounding him. Now I want you to take a minute, and I love to do this with Scripture, try to put ourselves in their shoes so that we can kind of feel what they're feeling and imagine what is happening around them. So imagine this scenario. David is in a, in a cave. Now, the only caves I've ever been in, even if it's 90 degrees outside, it's cold, it's usually kind of damp, it's dark, it's shadowy. Can you imagine his weariness, the bone-tired kind of weariness that you experience when life is falling apart? I mean, it is nothing like you thought it was going to be, and yet you still have to fight on. It's interesting that the author tells us that it's harvest time. Don't you wonder if David wouldn't have liked to be working in the fields instead of being holed up in some dank and chilly cave? Wouldn't have he have loved to walk with his wife in the cool of the evening just after dinner? Or maybe sit down and talk with friends around a campfire? Don't you think that he would have enjoyed some fresh fruits and vegetables instead of mountain goat jerky dried out on a rock? Don't you wonder if he ever longed for the quiet meadows, the cool streams, and the uncomplicated life of a shepherd. I think this makes sense in the context of this story. David doesn't just need sword-swinging warriors. 
David needs friends. I can imagine that he feels lonely, that he's feeling isolated and wistful. And that's why his close friends stole away to check in on him, to support him, to show their devotion to him. That's why the mighty, the, the mighty men dared to love David in a dangerous sort of way. So in your mind's eye, see David, the hunted, sitting with his friends. He may have been listening to their stories of heroics, their stories of harvest past, about maybe their wives and their kids. When David had this sudden craving for his old life, the life before the anointing, before being king or anointed to be king, and the constant hiding, and the, before the fighting and the killing and the plundering. And he says with longing, ah, if I could just have some fresh water from the well at the gate of Bethlehem. And what he was saying was, if I could just have what I was before, what I had before, innocence. And his friends, his three, I call them my peeps, the three mighty warriors determined to get water for David, no matter how dangerous the mission. So the three mightiest who have killed hundreds stood their ground, took out 24-digit giant, stole away in the darkness of night. Somehow they managed to break through the enemy line. They ran, according to his history, some 13 miles. They drew water from Bethlehem's well, and then they turned around, and they ran back to present it to their friend, the king. It was an offering of devotion. It was a heart gift. It was a way to say, we hear you, our king and our friend. And we will do whatever it is, no matter the cost, to see you fulfill your destiny. I think the water was symbolic of their complete affection and devotion. These guys were more than paid mercenaries. They were David's friends. And may I take a moment to, to just make a few observations from this part of David's life, of his story, and then maybe look at what does this mean to us as we live here in this age. First of all, just as King David was constantly battling the Philistines, a battle of blood and loss and death, so they're still a battle going on. I seriously even hate to talk about a battle. I'm so much more a hugger than a fighter. But there is an enemy. And there is a battle that wages. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, writes, For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Peter wrote, wrote that the devil is a prowling, roaring lion looking for someone to devour, which means to eat up, to consume entirely. We must never forget that this is a, spir a spiritual battle that it is not about boundary lines on a piece of real estate, the spoils of war, or even power. It's about people. For people are the greatest, God's greatest love. We're his kids. He wants us, you and me, to have a life of freedom from condemnation, a life full of meaning and of victory. There is a battle. Secondly, these men who became the greatest warriors were at first men who offered little but their willingness to hang out with David. They didn't bring money. They brought no influence and no power. They just showed up and stayed with him with no guarantee of greatness. Can I encourage you today? It doesn't matter if you're broken down, imperfect, a failure, doesn't matter. 
Just be a man or woman determined to follow the king, love the king, fight for the king. And Jesus, who is the king of this upside-down kingdom of misfits, he'll use you mightily. No one's called to be perfect or strong or have all the skills to follow his king. We just have to sign up, show up, stay in, and fight the spiritual battle for the long haul. And in our context today in 2017, here in Casper, Wyoming, at Highland Park Community Church, we fight the enemy of our souls, not in a formal military conscripted kind of unit, but by being in relationship with other Christ followers. We have to be in community. It's how we choose here to assemble the troops to fight in the battle. David needed other people to fulfill his call. He needed men around him. He needed people who loved him and wanted to see him succeed. He needed those guys beside him in battle. He needed men to take a stand when the enemy was descending. He needed friends to hear the cries of his heart and then step into the dangerous territory to quench his parched soul. You know what? We might not be called to be ruler of nations, but still, we need a community. And we need friends who will do the same as David's mighty men did for him. We need to surround ourselves with people who are on a like mission to love God and to love one another. We need people, men and women, who will fight at our sides for our families, for our hopes and our dreams. We need people who stand when everyone else is running away. As did the mighty warrior who stood in that far, far, far harvest field and would not back down until the enemy fell down dead. We need people who will show up when weakness has prevailed or when we simply need to talk about the good old days. And they don't just hear our words, but they hear our hearts. We need men and women around us who push us to do better, to be better. We need a community when we are too tired to move on. David's men fought for him. There's a, there's a, a part in scripture in, in the verse 21, I think. No, it was in uh, chapter 21 where they're talking about David battling. He's fighting and he is, he is knocking down the enemy and pretty soon he's so exhausted. And they would use the word so exhausted he could hardly stand. He was starting to stumble. And two of these mighty men came in and used the word rescued him because of his exhaustion. And I think there are times when we need that. We need people to rescue us. And remember when I was talking about reading First and Second Samuel, and I, over and over, I recorded David and his men, David and his men, David and his men. There comes a time after David is crowned that he no longer goes into battle with his mighty men. They go out and fight. Uh, they live together in community, and David stays in the palace. And this is kind of a teaser for next week, but David, when left alone, when bored and not being challenged to be better, does a series of the most atrocious things of his life. His community of mighty men were not present to challenge him or encourage him to do the right thing. And he blew it big time. Like David, like Jesus, he modeled the need for having a tribe, a community, a place you call your friends, a place to be safe. And even though Jesus spent time in solitude, we see that he spends time in solitude, a good deal of his waking hours, when he wasn't preaching or healing, he spent with his 12. They traveled together, they ate together, they talked together, they, they worked together. So if God, while choosing to take on the frailties of man, allowed himself to be nurtured, nurtured and nourished by human relationships, by community, we need to do the same. 
like Jesus and like David, we all need a place to belong. We are stronger together. Lastly, and this part of David's story reminds me that we need to intentionally become a mighty warrior for our tribe, for our community. We must have a few warriors who will live sacrificially. Just like you need some mighty men or some warrior women, someone needs you. Will you get some skin in the game? Will you give a little bit of yourself, your time, your resources, your strength, your skills, your experience, your comfort to fight the enemy? We need you to become men and women who will stand, defend, and love deeply. And it's in those small groups, those battalions, that we actually do damage to the enemy. And not, we don't even just, just protect the status quo. It's where we do damage. With the battle in mind, Paul wrote, and this is going to sound familiar, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you will extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert, always keeping Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We are in a battle, and we need to belong to a company of men and women so to encourage one another and fight together. And we need to become men and women of honor and valor. We don't have to engage, of course, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. We don't wage war as the world does. We fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. So like David's mighty men, bring all your brokenness to the king and all, all that you have to offer to the community and commit to become people of tenacity and fearlessness. Strap on the protection of righteousness and know that it doesn't have anything to do with you or what you've done or how good you are, but that you have righteousness because of Jesus and because of the way you have believed and he has loved you. Spend time in the word of God. Know that the truth sets you free, that it defeats the depression that oppresses. Sharpen your sword. Spar with one another to hone your skills. Encourage one another. And speak out your thanksgiving. Do it often and spend time in prayer, recalling and reliving God's faithfulness and, and prepping your heart for the battle. Do it with your comrades, your friends, your community. Just as Sergeant Brahman ran back into the burning Pentagon that day, over and over, and David's mighty men are found standing to fight off the enemy, we must fight too with a courageous kind of fierceness. And the promise of God is this. Though the evil one attacks, together we can stand and we can fight for one another. We are always stronger together. And the promise is, is that we win. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Which is really what that battle is all about. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, 
nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you for friends, for comrades who fight with us, who go before us, who stand with us. We love you, and we're grateful. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And now, will you stand, please? As you leave this place, take with you the confidence that God loves you, that he goes with you, before you and behind you, and that you will win the battle.